I believe that the Lord is giving a wake-up call to his church. His church is not a denomination. His church is not a physical building. His church is the body of Christ. And I believe that much of his church has been sleeping. They've just been coasting along. They've been taking a lot of things for granted. We have a sense of entitlement that we are children of God and that he's going to bless us and pour out his blessings and that we're just kind of traveling down the road of life. And, and there's been a lot of complacency and a lot of lukewarmness and a lot of lack of anticipation of his return because if we really believe in our heart that Jesus is coming soon, when somebody's coming to your house for dinner and you know that they're coming and you don't know the exact time, you're not going to wait till the last second and say, well, they're delaying their coming, so I think I'll just play a couple more video games. No. You would put the food in the warmer if you had to. And you would make sure that there isn't cobwebs hanging from the ceiling. You really would because, you know, kind of depressed people kind of look down. Now we see the specks on the floor, but I don't always see the cobwebs in the corner. But you would want to, if that was a special friend, even when it's my family and I see them all the time and they can pop in and see me and they see things as they are. If it's a holiday, if it's Christmas, if it's Easter, then I spend my time leading the house. And it's just ordinary people, but they're my people. We're ordinary people too, but we're God's people. And we are not anticipating just somebody coming to our house for dinner. We're anticipating the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We're anticipating our bridegroom. We're anticipating the return of our Savior, of the reason why we're alive and doing assignments on earth is not to have a fun time or an entertaining time or to be in our little corner of the world just waiting for the great event to happen. Every bit of our life should be in anticipation that he is coming soon. If he said it in the Bible, then we're closer to the return than ever before. But the church is saying the same thing that the Bible says. The Lord delays his coming. And so since he's not coming in our time frame, maybe not even in our lifetime, maybe not soon at all. Soon is not so soon. Uh, or we might even be praying like the song many years ago that they sang, wait a little longer, please, Jesus, until I get my loved ones in. And I'm sure that when he comes, he said, I have waited long enough. Where were you in relation to your loved ones? Well, you know they're not going to listen to me. Well, pray without ceasing. When did you give up on them? When did you give them over to the devil in the kingdom of darkness? When did you give up on believing God to save your household? And if you can't say it and you can't do it and you can't affect it and you can't change it and your salt and light isn't good enough to bring them in, then you can do the very best thing is pray and believe and anticipate that God is going to save them. Not wait a little longer. Well, what am I waiting for? For you to pray? Waiting for you to do something? Waiting for your faith to be active? Because oftentimes we just coast. We're just expecting because I prayed a prayer one time, so God's going to honor that prayer. Well, is that all we're going to do when you ache? A piece of bread one time and that's all you're going to eat for the rest of your life? That's enough for you? You know, I, I prayed a little simple childlike faith prayer once upon a time and so I expect that to happen. Well, you know, maybe you ought to add something to it. You know, come to a little more maturity and get a little more meat and potatoes on the table. Because I believe that when God spreads a table before us in the presence of our enemies, when I was praying this way, so I'm just giving you some of this stuff. 
We need to bring, wouldn't it be a good idea if we brought something to the table? Sometimes when we would go to somebody's house for dinner, we would ask if we could bring something, and if they told us no, maybe we would bring something anyway. Now, I'm not saying that for me, so don't bring, bring in food to my house. You don't need to do that, but I, I love, I love to, to, to prepare for my people. But you know, he prepares a place for us. What have we prepared for that place? You know, have we prepared a habitation for him? Have we prepared ourselves? Have we, what are we going to bring to the table? When, when he's prepared that table before you in the presence of your enemies, are we just going to go and eat the supper of the Lord? Or can we bring something to the table? Well, what can I bring? What, what can I bring that would, would add something to what God, well, really nothing, except what he has given you. The only thing valid that we can add to the table of the Lord is you can add to that table your faith that came from him. You know, it's pure faith. It's holy faith. It's unwavering faith. When I'm praying lately, I'm not using my faith at all. Faith in my faith. I want God's faith. The God that said, let there be light, and there was. My faith may be wavering. My faith may not be perfect faith. I'm not relying on that. I'm going to rely on his faith, the God faith, because God lives in us, the spirit of faith. When he's given you the spirit of faith, and his word, what did he say his word is? His word is spirit and life, and faith comes by hearing the word. So when I go to the table, I want to bring the word of God with me. The word that he said was in my heart and in my life. I want to bring it to the table. I want to bring faith that's unfeigned to the table. I mean pure faith, holy faith, unwavering faith. Faith in God, faith in his faith that he's given me. That he said every good and perfect gift comes from God. There can't be imperfect faith if it's the seed of faith, the word of faith, the gift of faith, the spirit of faith, the measure of faith. It is holy faith. And there's nothing, nothing better than that. Faith that moves mountains. Faith that divides the sea. Faith that walks on water. Faith that receives from God. The prayer of faith that saves the sick. Not what you think you've got, but what God has given unto you to use. The God faith that creates. The God faith that I am the God that healeth thee. That's the kind of faith that I want. God's faith. God's word. The power of the spirit of God. The spirit of God that I can bring to the table. That I can add something to it that is perfect, that is pure, that is holy, that is undefiled, that is powerful. The name of Jesus, never mind my name. Never not mind what I can do. How about what God can do? And I can do through him, not without him, not just beside him, but through him. I'm glad that he's called alongside to help me. And that my help comes from the Lord. But that's not exactly everything to me. I want to be doing it through him. Not just to him or for him, but through him. All things, meaning everything, because these are everything and all. And so we can only get through the things that we're going through, through Christ that strengthens us. Not just with him, I will strengthen you, help you, and uphold you with my own right hand. That's great and wonderful. But when we can go through it, through him, then you can do what you could not do before. You can endure hardness as a good soldier. Let me help you with this. 
in Jesus Christ. It's not enough to be a warrior. It's not enough to be a soldier. It's not enough to just have the power in the name of Jesus. We want to be in him using that name. Going through everything with him and in him. And it would be great if it was for him. I just love to think about this. As I was pacing and praying today about, oh Lord, what if it's for me? Well, I daily load you with benefits. Oh, well, what if it's just good for me? I give you good things to enjoy. Oh, it's okay for me to have this car? I mean, that's not of the flesh and the world and the devil. I give you good things to enjoy. So that's not selfish. Your life is hidden in me. So what's for you is for me. What's for me is for you. Do you see that? That when we have our life hidden in him, that we don't have to worry about self anymore. Or am I being selfish because I would like to have my favorite dish today to eat? I mean, it's a little pricey. I gotta go out and buy things that are not on my grocery list. And I don't need it. I don't need that. I don't need this dessert. I don't need that special ice cream. Is that a terrible, selfish attitude that my flesh wants this? Hey, when your life is hidden in him and he daily loads you with benefits, I don't think he wants you to go around the self-condemnation and examine every little thought and every little feeling. Say, oh, this is of the flesh. This is not for God. This is everything that we do should be for him. Everything that we are, your life, belongs. you've been bought with a price. So you don't have to be poor in order to please God. You don't have to buy everything at the second-hand store, maybe some things. I was really happy when I went to the flea market. Not with my, for me, I, I'm not a flea market person, but I went there just to spend time with my son and his wife. So I'm going through there, and of course, I'm just hanging along. And I saw this rack of clothes. You know, certainly not interesting. But one stuck out. Picked it up and lo and behold, same brand I like, same everything. Six bucks, not $30, not $40. Hey, I'll buy that, you know? And, and I thought, well, was it bad that I paid 30 40 dollars for this other one that's saying no, but he just blessed me with something that I didn't really need it. But he said he'd give you exceedingly abundantly above that which we could ever ask and imagine. And so if it seems like, well, we're not worthy, of course we're not worthy. But he is. He's worthy. And his blood purchased you and made you worthy, made you blessed, not to be a burden to yourself. You ever feel like you're a burden to yourself? I don't burden. I remember when my burden drove away. Well, I mean, I'm still here. Well, I didn't roll away yet. But God wants to bless us. To be a blessing, not to be selfish, but not to be greedy, not to you know, be covetous. I don't think that when I was walking through the flea market that I was coveting anything. I didn't expect to buy anything. And I, oh, I was just surprised. God gives us good things to enjoy. He daily loads us with benefits. Daily means every single day. His compassion's new every single day for you. Just as you are. This simple, little, ordinary person that he's made very 
complex and extraordinary in him. Because anything that belongs to God can no longer be ordinary. He takes that which is ordinary and makes it extraordinary. That which is common and makes it uncommon. No longer for sale and no longer used for any other purpose. Hey, the good news is that's us. That we belong to God. Our lives are hid in Him. In Him we are complete. And maybe the Lord wanted that dress for me. Well, I got it. <laughs> and there's so many things that He blesses His people with. And unfortunately, sometimes we just get into that state of gimme, 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 praise ye the Lord. No, it should be praying to the Lord all the time and seeking his kingdom first and his righteousness and let him add those things to you. Let him put that on the table for you. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow takes care of the things of itself. That's what the Bible says. Sufficient under the day is the evil thereof. There's enough trouble today. Don't borrow tomorrow's trouble. Wait till you get there and it's then today. You've got the sufficiency to take care of today. The insight, perhaps, into tomorrow, but not to fret, not to worry, not to wring your hands, not to get into fear, doubt, and unbelief, and worldly pursuits. So seek the kingdom of God first in his righteousness. Put a priority on God and his kingdom and his righteousness. And he'll give you whatever else you need. Whatever the world seeks for, you got it. Ooh, why you got it? Because God's got it, and he's got you. He doesn't want you to go around with a whole lot of need when he said, I'll supply it according to my riches to being Lord. Oh, really? Oh, he's rich, he's not broke. Isn't it great when you can go to your father and you don't have to borrow from him? I don't have to, oh, can I have a dollar or a shilling? I don't have, I just want to. No, he's not broke and he's not stingy. I love the fact that he loves to give to us. That it's his pleasure to give to his people. You want to give to those that you love. Sometimes you sacrifice to give to them, but he did that sacrifice when God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And as we believe on him, we will not perish, we will not perish, we will not perish. We have everlasting life, and he promised us abundant life. And I, I believe that we have abundance that, that he will give us, but we don't have to scream for it. We, when we're shouting to the Lord, we're shouting about his goodness, we're shouting about his presence, we're shouting about his word and his spirit and our life that's in him, his great salvation, his healing power invested in us. And his wonderful plan and purpose and pleasure to use us for his glory. Isn't that the greatest? That he would save us when we were lost? When we had nothing to bring to the table, then he furnished you under every good work so that you've got something to bring to the next meeting and table. Bring what he gave you. It's pure. It's holy. It's not going to be contrary or impalatable to the things that he's prepared for those that love him. You're going to be a preparation and have a prepared gift to give God who gives us good gifts all the time. The gifts of God are without repentance. He's not going to take it away from you, so why don't we use it? Use the gifts for the glory of God because God gives you grace and glory and gifts and ministries to be useful to him for that permanency and that which you can bring to the table. I like to think that we have many things that we're going to add to the table of the Lord, but nothing worldly, nothing 
common and ordinary, but even when we bring that which is imperfect to him, once it belongs to him, he'll make it right. He'll reconfigure it. He has a place for it, a space for it. It's now holy unto him. It no longer can be used by the world. You can't listen to me. If you're bought with a price and you're not for sale, nobody can pluck you out of the hands of God that recreated you and reconfigured you to fit in his body and his purpose and his plan and the desire of his holy heart and his kingdom without end. If he has done all of it, then how in the world, I shouldn't have used that word, how in the world, how can we possibly fit in this world? You don't fit in this world. You are to be separate, holy. You are God's property. With God's hand on you and you in his hand. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. You're not falling into his hands. He has embraced you and taken you and sealed you with his hand. It's a loving hand, a creative hand, a healing hand, an empowering hand, a giving hand, a providing hand, a helping hand. It is securing you. But he says that you can be instruments in his hands to be used for his glory. So how can we possibly, if we belong to God and we have given ourselves to him, as the Holy Spirit grew up and wooed us and revealed him unto us, and we came, and whosoever will, will come, he won't cast you out. He won't say, oh, too dirty. Too common, too ordinary, too nasty. I can't do it. Yeah, 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 I can. But what can you do? Well, I'll cleanse it from all unrighteousness with my blood. With my word, with my Holy Spirit. I will perfect that which concerns you because what concerns you concerns me. You belong to me and I sacrifice myself. That's what I brought to the table. Initially, my blood, my body, I sacrifice on the cross for you. That's how much I valued you when you were no good account, worthless, lost without hope, sinful, then no, couldn't save yourself, couldn't bring anything to me except yourself. But whosoever comes to me, I won't cast them out. I'll take them in. I'll clean them up. I'll purify them. I will sanctify them. I will own them. I will live in them. I will be with them. And they can be in me, complete. So you have no ordinary, worldly position anymore. You are in the world, but not of the world. You were of the world, but no more. You were common, but no more. You were unclean, but no more. You were imperfect, but no more. Because the perfect Lamb of God that perfects that which concerns you. So you no longer own yourself. Nobody else can own you. You can't be out in this world to be used by the world. No more common, ordinary purpose anymore. That you have a purpose that is God's purpose. The designer, the builder, the maker, the almighty God happens to live in you, be with you, owns you, operates through you and you through him. Wow, what a deal. That you can operate through him. You can live in him, move in him, have your being in him. Nobody can touch you. Nobody can harm you. You, but don't just take it for granted. Don't just go around like Hezekiah did after he was healed miraculously, had a death sentence on him. Then he got prideful. But God didn't dump him. He warned him. Well, oops. Sorry, repented. 
You know, there are times when we do really need to repent. Maybe every day I repent a lot. It's a really good deal to repent. You know, make sure your heart's right with God. You don't have to be right with everybody else. You can't make things right that are wrong. You can't make that which is crooked straight. You can't make those ungodly people want to be your friend. Uh -uh. But you can be a friend of God. Come on. He can be your constant companion, the lover of your soul. Not everybody's going to love your soul. You don't need their love. You've got perfect love to cast out all fear. Except the fear of the Lord. We don't want to lose that. And I believe that it's time for the church to come back to the fear of the Lord. It's time for them to wake up out of sleep. It's time for them to understand that you are holy because I am holy. I make you holy. I make you separate. You don't have to fit in. You don't have to compromise. Stop it! You don't need to be lukewarm because he has no desire to spew you out of his mouth. He warned them. He could have just dumped them. But he gave the warning to them. Don't be lukewarm. Have a zeal for the house of the Lord because, oh, well, maybe I don't have that zeal. Well, then quit trying to work it up. Stop trying to have zeal for the house of the Lord. Jesus had it. So if you're stepping into him and out of yourself, don't act like you have to do anything. Let him do it with you, through you, and you through him. That that zeal of the house of the Lord can eat you up because he did Jesus. That he was faithful and true. That was what he was and is and is to come. And we can't do that in our own little self. You can only be faithful and true in the one that is. In Jesus Christ, the righteous. You can't make yourself righteous. You can't make yourself holy. But we have that given unto us. And we need to walk in that. We can't walk in it if we're not walking in Jesus Christ, who is the light. The light is every man that cometh into the world and makes you light. You can only walk in the light. And the light is the word of God and that he watches over to perform. And we can only have a performance when we walk in him and that light that he is. So we don't have to rely on what we can do, how we're going to do it, if we're going to do it. Can we do it? Oh, yeah, we can. Through Christ. Stop relying on who you know, what you have, where you've been, what you see, what you understand, what you know, what you will know, understand, what you can give, or what you can bring. Forget it. Put it all aside. The Apostle Paul said, all those things that were profitable to him became unprofitable. So he could be a profitable servant of God. What could profit you and me in the flesh? That was out there in the world. Now we're not of the world. We are of the kingdom of God. And we have a king. And we have a captain. And we have an authority. And we don't have to be all of that. He is. So you don't have to go in your own authority. Oh, well, he's given me authority and power. Yeah, what power? Holy Spirit. He's got the absolute authority. You want your authority? You want him. You want to walk in your authority? You want to walk in your word? You want to walk in what you can do? Or do you want to just be in him? Walk in him, walk in his word. He'll perform his word, not yours. When his word becomes yours, that's another thing. He's not performing your word. Your words will fall to the ground if they're not God's word in your heart and in your mouth. So it will produce nothing, zero simple. But his word will always perform. He watches over it to perform it. He watches over his word to perform it in you, around you. Out of your mouth, word of faith, his faith. Now stop looking at your faith. You're putting, here's your little scales. And you're, you're testing your faith by the results that you have. Does anybody here do that? 
There's a little scale. And on here is the answered prayer and the success from your faith and your prayers of faith and, and all this. And here's your failures over here. So you're just kind of looking at that scale and seeing if you got enough faith for the next thing, you know, it's going tip, 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 tip. Oh, my faith's great, you know. So I can do this. No, you can't. Because it's not your faith. It's the gift of faith, the seed of faith, the measure of faith, the word of faith, the spirit of faith. Even angels of faith, which is spirit. So we have everything that we can do fully equipped for. What does the word say? Come on, let's get it out. Fully equipped for Well, I couldn't do that and this didn't go home. It wasn't a good work. Well, look, well, it wasn't God. Because if he's going to perform every good work, and he does everything according to his word, and his word is good. Good is the word of the Lord. It's always good. It's always God. It never changes. It never fails. Never, 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 never. Well, we fail. Well, you know what? He doesn't. There's no failures in him. So our struggle is not against the world. We're here to make a difference in the world, not to struggle. You know? We resist the devil and he flees, but you know what? Not until you submit yourself, therefore, before God. And, oh, is this the devil here? We'll flee from. Try it. Oh, go, go ahead. Just go ahead and try. See how how powerful you are. I did it one time. I thought, well, I'll do this. I'll cast that devil out of this person. Yeah, right. It was like the Hulk. Yo, say I got the devil. <laughs> Toss me like a little. Raggedy hand all against the wall, and I thought, oops, I guess that didn't work. I guess I need to learn something. I, I guess, you know, I resisted the devil, but he didn't work for me. Ooh, because he didn't teach you to submit yourself, therefore, unto God. I don't hear much about submission. I only hear about resisting. Very little about submitting. Hey, there is a protocol here. You're not all of that. Who do you think you are? Oh, I'm big and wonderful. No, we have a great, big, wonderful God. And when you think you're all that, take heed, lest you fall. Or you end up against the wall with the hope. Ah! I learned some things a little bit. The next time I faced the gorilla, Guerrilla warfare, oh my goodness. That was the worst. And you know, having my education in psychology and counseling and being expert, and I'm on another level. I'm not just your ordinary person coming against this guy that's wacko. I can use my psychology. I have ability. I got degrees. Right. That lion was still roaring. It wasn't working. Reasoning wasn't working. Nothing was working. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Finally, I said really loud, so loud that the neighbors heard it. In the name of Jesus, don't you shut up. Come out. And that gorilla, a lion turned into a lamb. Oh, I didn't know that I had a devil. Oh, oh. <laughs> because I had been fasting and praying. I had been doing the work. See, when you do the work of God, it isn't out there casting out devils. The work of God is in the prayer closet. 
He said, these things come out, what? By fasting. People, in some versions of the Bible, they took out the word fasting because nobody wants to fast. Come on, deny yourself, take up the cross and follow you. Give me a hamburger. You know, it gives me good things to enjoy. Let's go to the Burger King. Worry about the cholesterol later. <laughs> you know, God's got my back. <laughs> Get those French fries. Whatever. I'm not, I'm just, it's okay to be funny. You're not laughing, but it's, it, come on, it's the truth. Those things come out by fasting and prayer. So that's why it came out. That's why I wasn't. I'll tell you what. Just always before that, I was walking by and put a cord around my neck. It was choking me. And I stood there in silence. Yeah. It was at the workplace. Nobody else was there. I didn't move. I didn't scream. I didn't do anything yet. Because I had just come from church all by myself, fasting and praying. He's there. You know. Then he finally released me and said, You were scared. Well, in the flesh I was, but you know what? Fasting and prayer. I submitted myself, therefore, to God. When it says no one can touch you, you know, there wasn't any cord marks around my neck. Yeah. We need to do the work of God, which is what Jesus did. No mighty words. How they went up on a mountain to pray by himself. You don't need a group. You don't need a prayer. Come on. Have, well, let's have a prayer meeting. Why don't you have a prayer meeting in your closet? How come you have to call a prayer meeting? It's usually not to come and pray. It's usually to play. You know? How you play house. People can play church. Play play a lot of things. Play a role. You know? Only God sees the heart. And we need to get in that place by ourselves. Nobody needs to hear that prayer. Nobody needs to see you praying. Nobody know, needs to know your heart. He already does. And just, you don't need a, a group. You need God. Well, I don't need a group. Well, use the group after you get out of the prayer closet. Then, then he'll give you the fellowship of people of light, precious faith. Come on. What about the light, precious faith? You want the crowd or you want people like precious faith? What do you want? What's important to you to be a number, be a name with his name linked to you? You want to be in a crowd and lost in the crowd? Well, it'll be nice. No, he never called the crowd the church. He never called the crowd the harvest either. Yeah, could be. But now when you're trying to relate, trying to fit in, trying to find your place, well, do I fit here? No, somebody else is there. Well, move out of the way, move on. You know, it don't work that way. It doesn't. Yeah, I went to school to be a hillbilly. Yeah, it's hard. Down, 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 down. Let me up, up, up. Doesn't matter to me. We just want to be ready. We want to be willing. We want to be enabled. We want to spend that time in the presence of God with His fullness of joy. Not happy. You don't have to be happy. I'm not happy all the time. I was confronted this week and I said, I'm not happy. I think I told you I wasn't happy. Did I? Not happy. I'm not happy. When 
and see the suffering of other people and the sorrow of people. Well, you know what? Maybe that isn't so bad. Since Jesus was a man of sorrow. sorrow. It didn't say he was happy. He was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. Well, people that are happy want to be around happy. They don't want to go to the hospital, the nursing home. They don't want to go to the house of the sick. They don't want to visit the sick. It might be contagious. They don't want to be around depressed people because they want to be happy. So let's party. But we're not in the recreation room. We're in the field. And there's a lot of sorrowful people there and if you are a person like Jesus you're going to be a person of sorrow and acquainted with grief you will acquaint yourself and you will identify yourself with the pain and problems of other people because my Bible says and your Bible should say the same thing unless you got some new version that X's out all the good stuff and leaves all the fun stuff and I forgot what I was going to say <laughs> But anyway, that we are to, there it is, bear one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. That means if it's unbearable for them, and you come alongside to help because you're like Jesus Christ, that's what he is, the parakeet coming alongside to help. Where are you? Well, he's in you. How else is he going to do it? Well, he's just going to do it automatically. No, he's not. You know, he comforts those that are in any trouble so that we can become a comforter to anybody else's trouble. It isn't just so you say, hip, hip, hooray, I'm out of it, I'm on the other side, I'm going to the party. No. No. Pleasure's in his presence. The party's on the other side. At the marriage supper of the Lamb, we're not there yet. Here in the recreation room, this is not a fun room. This is a war room. This is war. This is not fun. I'm not here to have fun. Well, I thought we would. Huh? You said to give you good things to enjoy, and say you're going to have a party. <coughs> no. You're going to enjoy the presence of God. You're going to have things that He they load you with, but He didn't say go out and spend your time in pleasure. Pleasure in his presence, not in the world. They can't do anything like God can. They can't duplicate that pleasure. They can't duplicate that joy. They can't give you anything. That's why they call alcohol spirits. Because when you drink enough of it, you got the spirit all right. You lose your inhibitions and then, you know, you get mouthy and you start cussing and cussing other people out and driving like a maniac and killing people and hurting your family and whatever. It's spirits, all right. Bad one. It's called spirits. There's no spirits out there, no drugs, no alcohol, no anything that can duplicate the spirit of God and give you the joy of the Lord and you will not have a hangover and you won't be killing anybody. Devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. you in love. It's going to be genuine. It's going to be real. You can love your enemies. You can love your neighbors as yourself. You can even love those people that are in your family. Really? Yeah. Again, by the love of God. Not your love. His love. Yeah. His faith. So I don't believe we should take anything for granted. I'm going to wrap this up. Don't take anything for granted. Don't get yourself into a place of entitlement. I'm a child of God, so I can have this. Mm -hmm. What about your child of God so you can be everything that he wants you to be? And he'll give you what he wants you to have as you seek his kingdom first and his righteousness. He will add these things to you. Why don't you just let him add those things to your life that he wants you to have and subtract those things that are not good for you and stop mourning over the things that are taken away because it's not good for you. He will not withhold any good thing from you. But he wants to use you for his glory. He wants you to wake up. He wants you to... Get on the path of righteousness. He wants you to walk on the straight and narrow. That few there be that find it. I want to be one of those few. It scares me to think that I could veer off, get into the wide road that leads to destruction. 
get on the path of unrighteousness, thinking it's right, because if I do things that are right in my own eyes, it ain't right in his eyes. I need to have his eyes. I need to have his ears. I need to have his heart. I need to have his voice and his word. Does that mean we're always going to do it right now? No. No. There's scripture in the Bible that says we come in and out and find pasture. It would be nice if we were just stay in and not be out. And I'm sure nobody's ever interpreted that that way, but I do. So can't we just be in and stay in? How come we are in and out? In and out. You know, you open up the door and we go through it, but then we go out the other way. Why are we doing that? We are human beings, and we do. We go out, we get what we want. We get filled up, and then we go out, and we get used up. Ah, yeah. And we we'll go back in so we can get filled up and get to the table of the Lord. And we go all used up. And we make some times when we're empty, we make the wrong moves and wrong decisions. And we get ourselves in big fat messes that we made ourselves and we can blame everybody else, but the buck stops here. We, we messed up. We didn't stay in that place long enough to give us discernment enough to keep us from that. But all of us fail, but Jesus never fails, and he never fails to forgive us. But if we would wake up, if we would, would come into his presence, if we would stop playing church, if we would stop seeking the things of this world, if we would stop that and realize this world is not our home, it's not our resting place, this is not your destination, you are here on assignment only, and we need to fulfill our purposes here. Because our purposes need to be God's purposes, not our own visions, plans, dreams, desires of our own little hearts for this little tiny vapor of time. So let us do all things well because he does all things well. And the only way we can do all things well is when we're in him, when we're on fire for him, when we have the zeal of the Lord, when we have the prayer of faith, his faith, when we speak his word, not ours, when we, we relinquish the desires of our heart for his heart's desire. Wouldn't that be a good idea? And stop worrying about him fulfilling the desires of your heart. He said if you get to seek him and you get into the word and, and and meditate on it, he'll give it to you. Desires of your heart, but your desires of your heart will change. You will not have your own selfish desires. You'll have the desire of his heart. And he's in your heart by faith that he gives you. Faith that you operate in. We have to operate in him or it's not going to have yes. any fruitfulness at all.